you hardly find any challenge to power and authority. And I want you to, look, to talk about the distinction between the journalists in the field, and I thought you spoke about the journalists that you were writing with in Beirut when you were covering the Beirut war, versus what appears in the New York Times or appear in the major publication. How is that process of editing, how is the process of control, the pro the, that distinction develops? It's not about control. You don't need to censor the press. It'll censor itself. The journalists will do it. In many cases, again, I'm not trying to, you know, um, be cruel to my colleagues, not that I could be, because as I say, many of them are trying to do what I'm trying to do. This is not, you know, Bob standing up like a light in the darkness. There's lots of lights around, mm -hmm. and we're all struggling for the same thing, but the vast sort of the nexus of television journalism, front men, TV, you know, here in Baghdad, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I should just say that Martin Bell, who's a great reporter on the BBC, we used to joke in Bosnian war that he could actually do reports without using verbs. <laughs> and I, I once in front of him, and in front of a crowd of people about as big as you, gave a, a Martin Bell report. It went like this. Dawn, Sarajevo, Sniper's Alley, the dead, the wounded, the cemetery, dusk, Martin Bell, BBC, Sarajevo. <laughs> Not a single verb. <laughs> Hitler didn't use verbs, but I never pointed that out to Martin. Um, <laughs> if you're right wing, don't use verbs. <laughs> but no, um, I had a very sobering experience during the 2006 Hezbollah-Israel war, because day after day, not every day, but day after day, I was traveling down by road to southern Lebanon from Beirut, where at least I could sleep in my own bed at night, even if it was a bit noisy overhead. And, of course, we were under sporadic Israeli air attack, because they were obviously attacking all the terrorist cars on the road, including our terrorist car, if they could. And I was reporting for The Independent in, in London, and my words were being used exactly as I wrote them. And, you know, I am very fortunate. I have a very good, brave, strong editor who's a friend of mine, and I've got a publishing company that backs me, and it's great. So I'm, I'm you know, you can be as brave or courageous as you want as a journalist, but if your editor doesn't back you, you might as well become, uh, you know, you, you can run a fruit concession or a bus or anything you want. Um, but what was particularly harrowing in a way for me was that in the afternoons when we were coming back, you see, the time between Beirut and the east coast of America is seven hours. So on the way back at about 4 p.m. Beirut time, my American colleague, good friend of mine, fluent Arabist, been a friend since 1976 when I first met him when I went to Lebanon, um, would be in the back of the car calling his news desk in the United States. And the conversation, truly, it went like this. What was the headline on the story yesterday, this morning, right? I mean, yesterday's story, right? Yeah, but that's not what I said in the second paragraph. But I didn't write that. Well, would you put a Jerusalem paragraph in as a second pa They wanted balance, you see? Yeah, but surely the story yesterday was about the civilians who were killed in southern Lebanon. Bingo. And it went on every day like this. Um, and of course, the desk would be arguing, well, you know, you had one side of the story, there was another side. I know you saw this, but the Israelis denied it. I had a wonderful scene years and years ago, 1985, when an AP reporter and photographer went from Beirut to Sidon. Sidon was then under Israeli occupation. The Israeli army had already withdrawn from Beirut. And they witnessed a crowd of protesting Palestinian women outside or on the edge of the Einel Helway refugee camp. And an Israeli soldier stepped forward and aimed at a, a rather large Palestinian woman and shot her in the stomach and she died on the road. And there's a picture, you can see the guy with spectacles on, he's clearly identifiable, and then there's a picture of the woman lying on the road, and the reporter and the photographer, Paolo was the photographer, came back to Beirut and sent their story. And New York's, uh, AP's bureau in New York, which is the head office, came back on the telex, we didn't have mobile phones in those days, it was all telexing. How many of people here remember the telex machine? You're all old like me, you're all traveling at $17 out of Sacramento. Anyway. <laughs> um, or not, as the case may be. But um, what came back on the bell, 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 up came the automatic telex back. You can't run this until we've got the Israeli side of the story. And the bureau chief, Nick Tatros, he said, but we were there. We've got the pictures. That's the story. But you see, it was so clear cut that there must be another side. In the end, the Israelis denied the story in paragraph two, and it fell off the lead. Of course it did. It wasn't. It was a suspect story. It was a bit controversial. 
that's the answer to your question. Hmm. Well, let me shift now to the title of your talk today. What was it? Lies, misreporting, okay. and catastrophe in the yeah. Middle East. So, who's well, lying? Uh, we are. You are. The mere fact that we still talk in the language which we, I discussed just now, the fact we still do, and people, lots of the questions I'm being asked here and in Europe and so on when I give talks, or readers' letters I get, are all using this matrix of grammar and language and words which I've just used. Um, by accepting this language, we are part of the lie. Um, and you see the lie is ultimately there to cover up the catastrophe bit of the title of my talk, which is that there is at the moment no sign of hope in the Middle East. Don't tell me the <laughs> direct talks under Obama and uh, Madame La Clinton have anything to do with bringing peace to you know, Palestine. I put Palestine in quotation marks, you know, until it's a state, which I fear it will not be. Uh, it's mm -hmm. going to stay in quotation marks in my stories, uh, my reports, dispatches in the Independent. But, I mean, if it was such an important meeting, you know, 5 to 11, all the usual State Department nonsense, why didn't they hold it three months ago? Because of the... Uh, midterm elections. That's why it was held then. And of course, the, the future program, it's always a program in America, isn't it? Uh, the future program, which my uh, laptop always corrects and takes out one M, um, is that every two weeks, you know, these two uh, rather powerless people, Netanyahu, who has to look to his right, and Mahmoud Abbas, who doesn't really have any power, they were going to meet every two weeks so they can say, we've had another direct talk, even if they were actually talking about tea or coffee or something else. And then hopefully that'll carry on until the midterm elections are over, and then we'll no doubt start all over again. But there is no hope in the Middle East. Um, you know, I was talking about Area C. I don't think there is enough land left for a Palestinian state. And I think the Palestinians will either be encouraged to go off to Jordan or America, or they'll stay as gassed arbiter. Uh, I have to say, Amira Hass does not agree with me. She makes a point to me that these Palestinians, they won't lose, they won't, they, she said they hang on to their land. She admires them, of course, for doing that. Um, but um, I'm sorry to say, I don't think courage is enough. And I don't know if support is enough when you have an all-powerful superpower, oblique stroke empire, which is backing one side in the Middle East and effectively abandoning the other. Remember what Clinton always says, I love it. It is up to the parties themselves to make the necessary compromises, right? One lot are occupied, the other lot are doing the occupying. But when again you see the language is perverted, do you remember Madeleine Albright saying that Israel was under siege? Mm -hmm. This is during the Second Intifada, like there were, you know, Palestinian tanks in the streets of Haifa or Tel Aviv, etc. But no, going back, I don't see any hope coming there. I see no hope in Kashmir, which is one reason why the Pakistani intelligence service continues to support the Taliban. And one of the reasons I fear why American soldiers are dying in Afghanistan is because we will not deal with the issue of Kashmir, because we've taken India's side, because we want India to be our buffer against China and Russia. And so it goes on. We want to deal with democracy and human rights. And Muslims would like some packages of human rights off our supermarket shelves. But what most people in that region talk to me about is the need for justice. And justice we do not intend to give them, you see. And so I, I see no signs in, in the distance of anything getting better. I think it is going downhill faster and faster. People sometimes accuse me of being a, a, a negativist. Well, I'm sorry. Um, you won't be able to deal with the horrors of the Middle East until you realize that false hope is false and that we are now worse than we've ever been in the 34 years that I've been in the Middle East and watching it at first hand. I've never seen. Every morning I wake up in my home on the Mediterranean in Beirut and I see the palm tree swishing outside and I hear the waves and I say where is the explosion coming today and usually there is one and it's not always political it's very often um, physical where is the helicopter fallen down today uh, Afghanistan yesterday you know where is the latest shooting um, in Jerusalem this morning at 435 or 3 etc um, and it's getting worse and worse and we go along with the idea that there is hope light at the end of the tunnel within one year we're going to be able to announce a Palestinian state believe me you will not be hearing that in one year's time it is not going to happen and that is what we need to realize that it's not a question of fixing US Western policy it's coming to grips I hate the phrase coming to terms with but coming to grips with the reality of what's actually happening in the Middle East it's not just a question of 
getting our military out, which we should. The real is issue, the problem, I hate these words, issues, there's another one. The real underlying foundation, which we do not address in the Middle East, is that one group of people who have not lost their faith in God are controlled and they would see it oppressed and dominated, that's the best word to use, by the culture, society, economics, and military power of a people who have largely lost their faith in God. And I'm, I'm not a religious person. My uh, religion in any document goes down as journalist, and it stays that way. But I cannot escape living in the Middle East, living in the Muslim world, living in the Muslim part of Beirut, uh, and it, the Muslims, of course, are becoming more and more a majority in Lebanon, uh, as the Christians constantly point out. Um, but living there, I can see this very clearly. The odd thing is that when you're in the Middle East, the sharpness of this is not always so evident. I'm always struck by the fact, I mentioned this to Hatton when we were chatting and you were getting exasperated that we didn't chat to you just now. Um, I mentioned that, you know, I find it increasingly irritating to be leaving America on December 22nd and having a hotel receptionist say, happy holiday, at me. I mean, in the Middle East, my driver, who's a Sunni Muslim, says happy Christmas to me. And when it's the end of Ramadan, I say to him and my landlord, who's a Druze, Eid Mubarak, you know, congratulations on the Eid. But here you become so frightened of your multicultural world. You don't need to be in the Middle East where they've got a much better grip on what's happening. After all, they live there. These are not issues, problems at all. This fully acknowledged. I know my driver's a Muslim, but I regard him as a Muslim in the same way as I know he's got gray hair. It's part of him. It's not part of a wall between us or a division or a clash of civilizations, this preposterous um, late Mr. Huntington expression. Um, but the issue, I'm using the words myself, I hate it. The foundation <laughs> of this problem lies in the fact that one people still believe in God and the others largely, not totally, but largely do not. And the proof of it is to walk into any bookshop in the United States where there'll be books on the subject that say Muslims and the West. It doesn't say Islam and Christendom. It says Islam and the West, Muslims and America, you see. That is, now, I live, like most of you, in a secular world, whether it's because of the Renaissance, whether it's because of the Treaty of Berlin, the aftermath of the First World War, the Second World War, I don't know. I prefer this world, but I don't live in it. I live in the other world. But actually, it's the same one to me because I can still say Happy Christmas and I can still say Eid Mubarak. Why can't you do that here? Why is it Happy Holidays? That's an, it that's an interesting question. Uh, I think you raise a lot, a considerable number of issues, and I think... Issues? Problems. <laughs> uh, and... You speak about the Muslim world and the Arab world and not losing their belief in God. And uh, us in here in the West, uh, essentially considering ourselves secular or not having belief in God, but I think the picture in the U.S. is, is a little bit difficult or different. I know, I know. Uh, one is we have a president who was in the White House and God was speaking to him when he invaded Iraq. And, and, he, I, I, and, my, and he did defend America. He defended America by keeping the Viet Cong from the skies over Texas. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> and you have a rising tide of a very considerable Christian coalition. I know, I know. Uh, the Tea Party definitely uh, is influenced considerably with a particular uh, aspect of religion. And you have Pastor Jones. That's, that's true, Pastor Jones. So even though that we say that we are secular, our politics is heavily influenced and infused with religious terminology and symbolism. And I think in here the distinction between uh, secular as it has developed during the uh, past 200 years versus where we are at today in the American society and the heavy influence and uh, impact that the new religiosity within certain segments of the United States have had. And therefore, the clash of civilization becomes rationalized through a particular lens. Uh, the Islam versus the West becomes a way to rationalize it. And I think we need to take stock of that as we begin to discuss. 
The Middle East, and I have a problem with the term Middle East because that's a British, so you need to answer for that. I still don't know where the Middle I East is. I do apologize. I accept Let's your apologies.